That was a story that I'd never, ever, ever want to repeat again. It's a great way to start an investigation, having video evidence of the individual committing the crime, and they've posted it. I'm pretty certain terrorists don't tweet their plans three weeks in advance and end it with a kiss. <laughs> silent social revolution is taking place in offices, bedrooms and on the streets across Britain. Our obsession with all things Facebook, Twitter and YouTube means we are now constantly sharing our intimate details with our supposed friends. But who else might be monitoring what we're up to? It takes only an instant to upload, go viral and ultimately out of control. You're about to see what happens when innocent posts backfire and turn the lives of users upside down. As soon as he said my sentence, I was handcuffed and arriving at Wandsworth Prison, it's the emotion of feeling trapped because you know you can't go nowhere. Whether status updates or tweets, it's easy to share online. Take two friends who became internationally famous after a trip to Hollywood but for all the wrong reasons. I'm Lee Van Bryan, and this is Emily Banting. You're talking to us right now because we got suspected of terrorism because I tweeted that I was going to destroy America. We met at a mutual friend's uh, birthday party. And then um, Lee was on about us going on holiday together. Right, let's just go to LA, Hollywood, let's just be tourists. So I left Emily in charge of tickets, hotels, visas. <laughs> and I just, you know, kept control of Twitter. Lee and Emily embarked on their long journey to LA. Touching down at LAX airport, they were met by security. They scanned my fingerprints through and I was thinking, this is strange. And he goes, are you here with anyone? I was like, yeah, my friend Emily, she's that blonde girl there. And they went, oh, we'll go get for her. And I was thinking, cute jump. So I got all the way through, got my passport scanned, a lady came and found my suitcase. And then it got a bit weird because when she searched my suitcase, she was going through text messages and photos on my phone. Lee and Emily had unwittingly become the center of a terrorist scare. They took me into this holding room and the guy was doing an interview and he said that however I answered this would determine whether we went on holiday. Then he asked if I had a Twitter account. I thought, oh, he's going to want me to follow him or something. <laughs> and then he read out a tweet that was the destroy one first, he read out. And he was like, what do you mean by destroy the United States of America? And I was like, I didn't say that. That's not what it says. It says go over and destroy America means to drink. And he's like, oh. I honestly thought, we haven't done anything wrong. If we behave, they'll just write, right, okay, yeah. give us a warning, but no. Lee and Emily appealed to the common sense of the airport security staff, but it was too late. The matter had gone above their heads. The two friends were then transferred to a detainment center to await further interrogation. In separate public cells, they spent a terrifying few hours surrounded by LA criminals. I thought, oh no, this isn't where we want to be because like, if you've ever seen the films with the prisons and they have a room and people are beating each other and the stuff that you'd find in, like, the nasty side of L.A., and we were going to join them. <laughs> the only way is Essex in prison. <laughs> we know that the Department of Homeland Security and other law enforcement agencies of the United States monitor Twitter, Facebook, and a variety of other social media. You have to assume that anything you put out there in, into cyberspace could be seen by counterterrorism or other law enforcement in the United States. And you can't count on them to have a sense of humor. So after their terrifying prison ordeal, they were booted out of the country and lost the whole £2,000 they spent on their holiday. When I send a tweet, I sit there for three minutes looking at it and thinking, right, what have I wrote? I'm pretty certain terrorists don't tweet their plans three weeks in advance and end it with a kiss. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> we can get closer than ever to celebrities. Tweet them, Facebook message them, and if you're computer savvy enough, 
even mess with their love lives. But playing a joke on a celebrity can have some arresting results. The most public freight case yet. It's January 2011, and 21-year-old Gareth Krofsky of Lansing, West Sussex, has landed himself in jail for 12 months after hacking a celebrity's Facebook page. I started off getting into the hacking business and I was challenged to hack into Facebook. Who I hacked, um, that would be Selena Gomez. With her being secretly dating Justin Bieber at the time, it made sense, why not? Bieber fever is what they call it, and any girl of Justin's is going to come under scrutiny by millions of adoring fans. Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez, they're the most sickeningly sweet, perfect Hollywood couple imaginable. Bieber fans didn't take it too well when they saw Selena Gomez's Facebook status. Justin Bieber sucks. While she was receiving death threats, Gareth Krosky was bragging to the international hacking community about his skills. But how did the teenage McDonald's employee manage to gain access to a celebrity's personal and private Facebook account? Posing as Gomez's stepfather, manager and Facebook administrator Brian Teefy, Gareth Krosky contacted Facebook admin and convinced them to alter the login information at his request. And within a five minute period of posting Justin Bieber sucks, she had over 500,000 replies, there was hate, there was everything. Any words you could think of, there was in there. You're just thinking it as a challenge. You don't think about the consequences. You don't think about the reactions or what impact it can cause on a person at the time. The Computer Misuse Act has made it very clear that if you go and intervene in somebody else's computer, computer it's a criminal offence um, for which you can get a custodial sentence. I really knew when I was getting into trouble was when my house got raided at 6 o'clock in the morning. They seized everything, my computers, my family's computers, laptops, iPhones, my phone. The judge handed down a 12-month prison sentence to Gareth. As soon as he said my sentence, I was handcuffed. And arriving at Wandsworth Prison, it's the emotion of feeling trapped because you know you can't go nowhere. I believe that Gareth Krosky was made as an example to show to everybody else that invasion of privacy on this scale is not on, it's not tolerated, and to act as a deterrent for anybody else thinking of doing the same thing. We are told not to trust strangers in real life, but the comfort of online anonymity can make you overly familiar with virtual strangers, people we think we'll never meet. So what happens when one of these people decides to make an entrance into your real world? Nicola Rocco was dating Michael Andre, the brother of Peter Andre. When an anonymous Twitter user by the name of Kay Maddock came into the mix, Nicola Rocco found herself in the centre of a controversy that would lead to her arrest on the grounds of slander and online harassment. I met Mike through a friend. We went out a few times as friends for one and then kind of got together and went out for a few months. It was cool, yeah, just like any other relationship really. Nothing too serious, had fun. But soon after the end of their brief relationship, Nicola noticed a string of tweets by the anonymous Twitter user Kay Maddock with some quite libelous and slanderous accusations um, about Michael Andre. If you're suddenly hearing stories about your ex allegedly cheating on you whilst you were dating him at the same time, maybe curiosity would say, I want to find out a little bit more about that. And Nicola did. She made contact with Kay Maddock. I sent this girl a message on Twitter and um, asked her what it was all about, basically. Via private Facebook messages, Nicola told Kay Maddock personal details about her relationship with Michael, seemingly unaware that this private information was being streamed to a public Twitter feed. The information contained within the tweets 
painted Michael in a very unflattering light. K-Malik have been targeting Mike and Pete for, for quite a while, I think. Obviously, they both wanted to know who it was. They'd seen my name attached to quite a lot of the messages and the posts, so they must have put two and two together. Mike probably thought it was me. He reported it to the police. Michael had reason to believe that Nicola was posing as Kay Maddock as a way to anonymously harass him. Generally, slander, libel, defamation, they're civil offences, so you would take action to recover damages for the things that somebody has said about you that questions your honesty, your integrity, or your character in some other way. However, there are times when people make comments about each other um, which go beyond that. I was in bed on the Tuesday morning, half eight. The police came into my flat, took my phone, my laptop, and arrested me in my pajamas. They really interrogated me. Um, they asked me stuff about Mike and how often I use Twitter. They asked me about how many accounts I had. It was just complete interrogation. Yes, I was in Brazil at the time, and I heard about it, and I just couldn't believe how far it had gone. I felt sorry for Nicola because it, it wasn't her. But the police weren't totally convinced that Nicola and Kay Maddock weren't one and the same. Whenever this mystery treater was on, Nicola wasn't, and vice versa. That's not a nice thing to be labelled as somebody who's doing crazy things. But the police found no evidence that Nicola was behind any of the slanderous Twitter feeds. Eventually they let me go, but not with my laptop and not with my phone. They kept hold of that and I didn't actually get back for three months. I've definitely learned that talking to people you don't really know and giving out too much information, you just don't know what people are going to do with it, you don't know you could be being set up. It's it's a dangerous game, really. It's just a very interesting tangled web, and even to this day, no one knows who Kay Maddock is. The Ministry of Defence is known for being hot on surveillance. So if you work for them protecting the royal family, then using social media to speak your mind might not be the best idea, as one young soldier found out. A career in the military means the highest standards of conduct are expected at all times. Cameron Riley didn't seem to have this golden rule at the forefront of his mind when he posted a lengthy rant online about Kate Middleton. If you're a Royal Guard, tweeting about anything to do with your job and the Royal Family is a major no. Cameron Riley, 18, was a member of the prestigious Scots Guard. He was placed on security detail for the royal wedding, a day when the eyes of the world were on Buckingham Palace and security was at its highest. Several days before the royal wedding was to take place, Kate Middleton and Prince William drove past the guards. Kate waved casually in the young guard's direction. But Cameron felt he deserved more than just a wave. He turned to Facebook to vent his frustration. Although it is unlikely that Her Majesty clocked Cameron's rants, the top brass at the MOD did see it and were not amused. The standards we expect of our service personnel are the highest standards of conduct. Much in the same way as you wouldn't talk about sensitive information in a pub, we wouldn't expect you to do that online. I think that I would have serious concerns about this person's spelling, punctuation, grammar, language. But I think what's really interesting, I think if you are in the army or if you are in the armed forces, I think that's a vocation and I think you do it because you, you want to protect your queen and country. Kate Middleton could potentially be our queen and it doesn't imply to me that this person wants to protect the future queen. Cameron Riley was promptly removed from service at the royal wedding and reassigned to another, less glamorous role within the MOD. The police can spend endless hours tracking down lawbreakers and evidence to charge them. But now... They can also simply log on to YouTube and wait for the criminals to do the job for them, 
even serving up their own incriminating video evidence. Should we pay for it? Should we fuck? It's a great way to start an investigation, having video evidence of the individual committing the crime, and they've posted it. Who pays for petrol nowadays anyway? Leeds resident Andrew Kellett had his entire life changed by YouTube. I was just going out, driving cars, getting involved with street races, hanging about with mates on street corners and there wasn't really that much to do, so... Got a new phone with a camera function on, which was quite good at the time. Started recording some of the things I'd done, sort of go home on a night and replay through them all. Lining up, we're all lining up, I think, for a good fucking hard song. I can feel it coming. It's coming. Ah! <laughs> Come on, beat it, beat it, beat it. <laughs> Andrew was then uploading the videos of his illegal activities to YouTube for the entertainment of his mates. The kind of videos I'll be posting online a bit. I said mostly orientated around street racing, being irresponsible in cars, just speeding, breaking just general driving laws. Who no, says street racing's irresponsible? Fucking show me. We'd all be talking about it. They're like, God, did you record that? Did you record me going past the 120 mile an hour? Oh, I can't wait to get home and see it tonight. In a short space of time, Andrew accumulated almost 90 incriminating videos on his YouTube channel. Everybody's doing what I was showing, everyone's been antisocial, everyone's street racing, just... Yeah, I think I'd be the only one stupid enough at the time to actually film it than <laughs> portray it on YouTube. Made us kind of famous in a way. Yeah, well, we didn't know it was going to be like, as much as it was, it was just for fun, really, just to film what we were doing. But we didn't realise the entire world would be watching us. And that included the police. We don't have a YouTube squad. Um, but what we do have is a lot of people that use YouTube, see it, and if they see something that's illegal, they'll let us know. Who pays for petrol nowadays anyway? It's a, a simple evidence gathering exercise, and then we make a decision about prosecution. And for the authorities to look at what I did and realise, we can just bag this all up in one, there's the evidence there, they know where he lives, we can sort of tie all this together. The council showed up at Andrew's front door with a stack of evidence and a court date. I actually got an Osbo put out against me to stay away from YouTube, uploading videos for two years. And that's the, <laughs> that's the moment where it's like, wow, this is really big and this is really annoying a lot of people, this is offending a lot of people. So I didn't take a step back at that time and think, what am I doing? I'm now a dad to a two-year-old girl and she's more than enough to turn my life around, more than enough reason to do it. What's wrong? Oh, where's Sasha Dobbins? Right here. It does make you think, it makes you take a step back and realise just how big of an audience you're inviting into whatever it is you're uploading online, whatever you're updating online, whether it's a status on Facebook or a video on YouTube, you, there's a lot of people looking. Uploading a fun, self-shot video on YouTube is now the norm for thousands. But we don't give a second thought to who will end up watching. For one hapless couple, not thinking before posting got them splashed across the world's media. I've only just discovered Twitter. Facebook, I'm on all the time. I search things on YouTube, but I don't upload anything to uh, YouTube anymore because of obviously the implications that happened last time. Kerry and Alec got themselves into hot water after having a bit of fun on a rainy day. We were going out for the day. It was really raining. And when it gets wet, the water goes all the way across the road, so basically the cars either have to swerve to, to go round the puddle and go on the opposite side of the road or go through the puddle. We drove up here, um, loads of kids on the edge of the road shouting for cars to splash them. We thought we'll give these kids what they want. Puddle at the bottom of the hill, coming up, kids at the bottom of the hill. We got to the top of the hill, come down, um, obviously, Alec filmed it with his nice commentary. Come on, come on! Yeah, yeah that was brilliant! They loved it. They were Jumping like, jump on there, hands in the air, like, yeah! And they wanted us to do it again. And yeah, I went home, put it onto Facebook. 
then I thought, well, I'll put it onto YouTube, tagged our names in it, mm. and then the fun began after that. Within hours of posting the video on YouTube, Kerry was receiving dozens of abusive comments. There was a lot of stuff like um, saying that I was worse than a paedophile, that I should be hung, strung and quartered. About her family and about her, her being from a broken home and a prostitute as a mother and an alcoholic father. Kerry was understandably upset by the lies, but it didn't stop there. Some guy had written on YouTube, um, he was really annoyed about the video and he had said that he was going to contact the police and, and he did. Kerry was now wanted by the local constabulary on charges of reckless driving. I had to go and hand myself in to the police station. Um, I got three points on my license, uh, license and a fine. Kerry and Alec believed that this was the end of the story until they realised their happy splashing escapades had gone viral. Somebody I know in America has sort of rung me up or messaged me saying, you're on CNN News, they took your Facebook profile picture and you're all over the news over here. <laughs> the fallout from the publicity of the incident also caused shockwaves in Kerry's real life. I just finished a job um, in a care home looking after sort of disabled children and I was due to start in another place. They'd give me the all clear saying, yeah, that's your start day. And then I got a letter saying that um, because of cutbacks, they couldn't sort of take me on anymore. Somebody told me a couple of months later on that because of the impact of the media, I wasn't allowed to go and work there for that reason. At the time, I thought it was fun. The kids wanted to do it, you know, having a bit of banter with them, a bit of a laugh with them. But now looking back at it, yeah, you know, if I'd come off the road or anything, it would have been a lot more of a serious matter. Here we go, Louis. Puddle at the bottom of the hill. Coming up, kids at the bottom of the hill. Come on, come on, yeah! Yeah, that was brilliant! Awesome! <laughs> When you're having a party, it's natural to want to let everyone know they're invited. Just make sure that by everyone, you don't mean Facebook's one billion users. Right now, we are outside my house where we threw the Facebook party, where every, all the 300 people turned up and it was just absolutely manic. Party checklist, crisps, beer, blue WKD, extra loo roll, 300 uninvited guests. Dog squad? <laughs> I think Jordan, he is just a bit of a lad and he likes to impress people, <laughs> ladies in particular. I arranged with the girl next door to throw the party and I said I would have my house open. It took me about two months to persuade my mum to let me do it, but eventually I got round her. When Jordan's mum finally agreed to host 80 guests in her house and garden, she thought the worst that could happen might be a broken ornament, a beer stain on the carpet or an ill teenager. I invited through like socialising with my friends, like inbox on Facebook, um, or if I bump into them, I'd say, oh, you, I'm having a party soon, do you want to come? Bring a couple of friends if you want. Though some invitees didn't have the same respect for Jordan's exclusive guest list. It ended up on Facebook, so everybody saw it. Six o'clock, I was a bit like, a bit nervous, because I wasn't sure if people were going to turn up, how the weather was going to be like. And then eventually, it got to about 7 o'clock, I was just like, oh, great, right, the DJ turned up, my friends all started turning up, and I was, I was getting in a good mood. By about 9, half 9, there was about three to 400 people standing around me, and I'm just like, oh, my God. The party had taken on a life of its own. I first heard, uh, thought something was really going on when there was a lot of cars and a lot of people gathering all of a sudden in the road, which is pretty unusual for around here. There was about 300 people in there, and eventually it all come out to here. All was down here, there was just people everywhere. You could definitely tell that it was starting to get out of hand. And what, nine o'clock? Yeah. yeah. Not even that late. But to be honest, I thought it was absolutely awesome, but the police didn't. When the police arrived, people just started kicking off. People are drunk, so people are throwing bottles at the police, but then the police bring dogs. A few people I know got bitten by dogs, actually. The riot police um, kind of made a line and pushed everybody down the street. And then the helicopter turned up. The second the helicopter went over, everybody all at once just went crazy, just like throwing their bottles, just going mental. I stayed in because I thought it was going to be more exciting watching this than going up the pub for a couple of points. It isn't about piling in and trying to spoil things, but clearly, 
if there's public disorder or if there's a risk of harm to people, particularly children, we've got an obligation to get involved and we will do. So after such an eventful evening, Jordan had a newfound appreciation for the power of social media. So I was like, oh my God, what we're done. I caused so much trouble out of that. It was mad. I think Jordan was a bit in shock the next morning. I think he was a bit sheepish, to say the least. Never been to another party no. of his. I think he learned his lesson. Yeah, definitely. I <laughs> <laughs> just haven't been invited. Yeah. <laughs> One or the other. Mm. Hope not. When a Facebook party in the UK gets out of control, expect lawsuits from neighbours and carnage on the front lawn. But in Germany, while the numbers may be uber large, they still manage to keep the party spirit alive. Yeah, hips and bounce the blackest part of the town. It's June 2011 in Hamburg, Germany, and Tessa is planning her sweet 16. Nothing fancy, just a few friends around to her house. Little does she know that with the help of Facebook, she will soon become a minor local celebrity. Tessa didn't realise the repercussions of making the event public instead of private, until 15,000 people RSVP'd to the invite. Almost overnight, Tessa had become an internet sensation as her party went viral. Her parents freaked. They cancelled the party, hired a private security force and sent out public announcements through the local media that the party was off. But despite these efforts, over 1,500 happy revellers flooded the streets wanting to celebrate the birthday of their local hero. Whilst all this was happening on her front doorstep, Tessa was nowhere to be seen. She'd been whisked away to her grandparents' house to ride out the storm. But despite the fears of Tessa's family, neighbours and the police, the impromptu street festival was a peaceful one. complete stranger where you live when you're going out and the names of your family and friends would never happen so if you put this kind of info online you could be jumping into bed with trouble that was a story that i'd never ever ever want to repeat again it was the start of the social media revolution and davy tyler was leading the way He'd racked up over 7,000 MySpace friends in a short period of time. I wouldn't say I was a celebrity, but, you know, I'd say that it got to a point where you were infamous. He was known as Davy Tyler from MySpace. That, that, that was kind of his surname. He was viral. My use of MySpace back then, was I was very open. It was, it was really good fun. You know, I'd, I'd party constantly, go out clubbing constantly. Yeah, it was, it was a crazy lifestyle. Davy felt comfortable within the group of like-minded friends he'd found on the internet. He began sharing more and more of his life online. Everything about my life was out in the public eye, but it, it just felt normal. I think there is a, a, a line that is very thin where you would cross it, where you're being open and then you're just being like you're taking a risk you're letting people in but it's so easy not to realize where that line is when you're online because you get caught up in telling people things you get caught up with the responses they give you it's almost like the the, the feedback you get can be so positive you think oh why not i'm going to tell this person some more well, I've just celebrated moving into a new flat. I'm really excited about moving. We've been first moved from away from parents for, I can't wait for this. So I think I'm going to go out clubbing and get absolutely wrecked. We'd all been out clubbing, um, probably like a Saturday night or something in central London. Come home pretty early in the morning, all a bit misty eyed. I come through the door drunk as anything, and I, I'm like, there's a lump in my bed. I get closer to my bed, and as I come out, someone just pulls down the covers. 
and turns around and says, Hi Davy, it's me. And I'm just thinking, am I really drunk? Do I know this person? Where do I know them from? And then it clicks and then I was like, how, how, who are you? Have I, have I met you before? And um, what the fuck are you doing in my room? I'm here. Dave was like, get out. So who was this mystery person throwing a surprise slumber party in Davy's bed? I basically clicked on my messages, went through all of them, and I, it, I noticed there was a message, but it was a message I've never responded to. He literally just jumped the whole gun to, I'm going to sharp at his house, unaware, in his bed, and assume that he's going to be fine with it. The man arrived on Davy's doorstep, armed with a load of information he'd garnered from Davy's MySpace exploits. He used this info to convince Davy's housemates he was a close friend and gained entry to the house. Now I just, I tend to be really weary of what I do. You know, I wouldn't put anything up where people could so openly enter my life. Luckily, this person wasn't a, a psycho. Having a laugh at work always helps the nine to five to pass by quickly. But your boss may not quite share your sense of humour. One photogenic employee did not think that far ahead as he struck some less than professional poses during his tea break. Gad is mad. He's always just up for a laugh. Generally, Gary doesn't think things through, though. No. I think he just acts on impulse. <laughs> when I first started, I thought it was a, a good laugh, it was a good crowd. It was all about doing our own thing, done my job. Once job was done, well, I had a laugh. On a quiet Sunday afternoon, cheeky chap Gary decided to fill the remaining 30 minutes of his shift by getting creative with his camera in the storeroom. Once the props were sighted, Gary's creative inspiration came thick and fast. That was the first picture that I took. That was the, the one with the wig on when I came across the wig. I uh, moved on to the skateboard, which I found lying in the corner. Gary straddled a piñata in the shape of a horse, made some crude sculptures with a bunch of plastic bags, and then practised his interpretive dance moves on a collie. As I'm emptying the shelves, I find an empty shelf. <laughs> and then just lay in the shelf and pretend there was something. The final photograph of the session was the naughtiest of all. <laughs> <laughs> when Gary got home from work that evening, he uploaded his photos to Facebook, sharing it with his friends. When he sent me the photos, I just thought that they were a laugh and it was just typical Gary, it was quite funny. Um, just the positions that he got into, it was just, it was just funny. But Gary's employers didn't think so. In fact, not many employers would. I think the mistake's easy to make that you think that people can't see photos. You think you're having a good time, you're having a bit of banter with your friends, but you are wearing a work uniform at the end of the day, you are a representative of that company, it's going out for the whole world to see. In that case, when the, the sort of integrity of the brand, I suppose, comes into question, action would have to be taken. As I found out about the pictures, because I had obviously a couple of colleagues on, the, on my Facebook, um, and I think one person looked at the picture and then maybe one showed another and another showed another. Gary was suspended for two weeks, during which time rumours circulated that the incident could lead to dismissal. Gary jumped the gun and resigned having learned a harsh lesson. I didn't realise the power of Facebook and how it can affect, how the smallest thing can affect basically your career. Work and your friends and family are two separate things. I wouldn't put my work on Facebook ever again. I just thought it was a wee bit harsh. I thought maybe a warning would yeah, have been I enough. Yeah, maybe just get suspended and then a warning, but... To lose your job is a bit much over yeah. it, I think. Still to this day, I don't see, I, don't, I, I personally still don't see the big deal about the pictures, I don't think. It's, I still don't think it's a sackable offence, to be honest with you. <laughs> Social media has made sharing photos easier than ever. Friends, family, baby shots, holiday snaps, it's what Facebook and Twitter thrive on. But some photos may get you much more than just a little like. My name's Charlie Bell. I'm a model and a beauty queen. 
I've been modelling since I was about seven years old. I did teaching at university um, and modelling I'm just going to carry on doing until I'm too old and wrinkly that nobody wants me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have aspirations to make modelling a career until after Bobby was born. Maybe it was the fact that I was a mum and I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it, but I did start to take it more seriously and start pushing myself. There you go, perfect. So the photos um, that caused all the controversy um, were actually taken by a photographer and a really good friend of mine called Mark Edmondson. Just after uh, Bobby was born, sorry, about six months or so, um, Charlie was, she wasn't exactly down, but she wasn't so like feeling her usual bubbly self. So the whole idea of doing the shoot was obviously we'd become friends and I just decided I wanted to cheer her up and show her that she'd still got it. They're my favourite set of pictures that I've got to this day um, and I was really proud of them at the time. When I put the photos on Facebook, I, did, I wasn't even thinking about the effects of them on anything. I was proud of them and I loved them and I wanted other people to see them and share them with me. I was looking to create role models. Basically high quality girls with high values, with bright futures and a good clean reputation. The Miss Great Britain franchise was changing. For the first time ever, single mothers were allowed to compete. But Charlie, competing for the Miss Great Britain title would mean making history. And she was already one step closer by winning the Miss York City crown. As a pageant contestant, I have to say she was ideal. She was beautiful, she was elegant, she walked beautifully, she was easy to train. Pretty much everything you're looking for in a pageant contestant. But of course, there are strict rules to comply to in the pageant world. We didn't allow nudity. We didn't want any girls having naked pictures posted anywhere that could be available on the internet or anything that would be a misrepresentation of the role model that we were seeking. What I did with many other girls who were the Miss Great Britain title holders at that time, is I would just watch them on Facebook. They were all there, and if they posted anything, I'd read it and just kind of advise. Late one night, Wendy logged on to Facebook and saw what she thought to be nude pictures of Charlie. They were glamorous, but not glamour photographs. That's not Charlie. These were commercial-style lingerie photographs and things like that. And we did some, it's what's known in the business as implied nude. Clever camera work, strategically placed props and Photoshop are all used to imply nudity. Some people can argue that she was covered so she's not nude. I didn't see clothes. The emperor was nude, was he not? It's to argue, I saw nude. I found out that I'd lost my title very publicly, actually. In the morning, I had an email um, from the CO saying that she'd found nude photographs and that she was going to take my title off me. So I logged on online and yeah, it was out there all over Facebook, all over um, all the Beauty Queen fan pages. It was literally global. I felt exploited and really unfairly treated as well. And the main thing was that actually I hadn't broken any rules, so it was frustrating. Charlie contested Miss Great Britain's decision to decrown her. I've continued to try and fight to get my title back over the last couple of years. Finally, Charlie was successful. The Miss York title was reinstated. She had got her crown back. It's a really nice feeling to know that things have been put right again and I can move on and move away from that now, from that period in my life. Social media is like the wild west of gossip with jokes about pop stars, football players and politicians endlessly firing off. But beware, not everyone will see your jokes as dead funny. Is it a joke? 
It can't, it can't be a joke. It's too cruel for a joke. It didn't even cross my mind that Artan's mom was on Facebook. I had no idea. I've known them for years. I'm really close with them. They're like my brothers. Artan and his mates. Very cheeky boys. Typical today's teenagers. We just play pranks on each other all the time. Just started this one little joke and it carried on and carried on. And then when it came to this prank, that was just like, I think the biggest one that they ever did. My dad told me there was a football tournament going on. And so I said, all right, cool, I was down for it. I hadn't played football in a while, so I said, all right, let's go. Well, it was basically me, Naeem, and another friend. We was on Facebook chat and we we're kind of bored. Artem wasn't with us as well, we we're just bored. He, we basically thought, you know what, let's end the night on a funny note. Let's pretend our son's dead on Facebook. <laughs> That's when the phone rang. My sister started shouting, where's Artan? Where's Artan? I said, He's, well, he went to play football. He said, are you sure? Open Facebook, open it quickly, quickly, quickly. And I opened my Facebook, opened his page. Oh my God. Within five minutes, it was like... It just sort of snowballed and... Yeah, 50 notifications each. And then we got a bad reaction. Like, everyone was sort, sort of, of like... backfired. Yeah, <laughs> backfired. <laughs> When my sisters phoned me, that's how I was thinking, oh my God, maybe it's the truth, you know, because maybe something really did happen. After I finished the game, like, I sat down, I looked at my phone and I just saw 50 missed calls, 75 text messages, and I was like, what the hell is happening? First thing that went to my mind was Facebook. I, I thought, family's probably seen this. And when I saw loads of texts from my mum, I was like, yeah, she's definitely seen this. She saw me, she made sure I was alright, and then the shouting started happening. Are you crazy? What kind of joke is this? You don't play these things. Oh no, it's just a joke, my friend. <laughs> what do you mean it's just a... It was just the worst thing in my life. I was surprised a lot of people didn't see it as a joke. It was a good two weeks in school where everyone just like was having a go at us for the, about the whole thing. Now the girls got pretty offended, they're pretty upset, just like the rest of them, especially since our turn, he's, he's, he's good with the girls. Still, to this day, I find it funny. We didn't really think about the consequences. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, and it's not a pleasant experience that we had. It's now clear that exploits online can get you arrested, lose you your job, your boyfriend, and even get you deported. When I send a tweet, I sit there for three minutes looking at it, thinking, right, what have I wrote? Who can, who can change this? Who can like take it the wrong way? Be very careful when you use it, because even though you're sat behind a computer screen, you can still get in trouble for it. Everything about my life was out in the public eye. Talking to people you don't really know and giving out too much information, you just don't know what people are going to do with it. You don't know you could be being set up. It's, it's a dangerous game, really. No, I just, I tend to be really weary of what I do. I don't upload anything to uh, YouTube anymore because of obviously the implications that happened last time. You know, I wouldn't put anything up where people could so openly enter my life. I have to say I have learned from this experience um, how powerful Facebook and online networking can be. Um, and how careful you have to be about what you put out there and who can see it. It makes you take a step back and realise just how big of an audience you're inviting into whatever it is you're uploading online, whatever you're updating online, whether it's a status on Facebook or a video on YouTube. You, there's a lot of people looking. We now live in a world where we can never be sure who's out there learning about our deepest secrets and private moments. So next time you like that link of someone else's digital fail, remember, you could be one click away from your own online nightmare.